Good evening. Good evening, my name is Angela Bermudez, and on behalf of the Center for Ethics and Culture, I welcome you to the third installment of the Fall 2012 Catholic Literature Series. Every fall since 2002, the Center for Ethics and Culture has sponsored this event, fe featuring four lectures focused on prominent figures in the Catholic literary tradition. The series sprang from the Center's desire to expose the Notre Dame community to the richness of the Catholic literary heritage. The Center for Ethics and Culture hopes to promote writers both for the quality of their works and the uniquely Catholic dimension of their literary perspectives. For this year's Catholic Literature Series, we chose to revisit J.R.R. Tolkien, an author who has already been featured, but whose incredible talent and influence merit a second look. Though most undergraduates have probably read The Lord of the Rings, or at least seen the movies, relatively few of them may be aware of the deep influence Tolkien's Catholic faith had in shaping that work. For this reason, as we, jo as we join Tolkien fans everywhere in anticipating the release of the upcoming Hobbit, Hobbit movie this December, and two other Hobbit films currently in the works, we decided to take the opportunity to examine Tolkien's work in light of his faith. Please mark your calendars for next Tuesday, September 25th, when Ralph Wood, professor of theology and literature at Baylor University, will join us to continue the discussion on Tolkien. Tonight's lecturer is Mary Keyes, associate professor of political science. Her research and teaching interests span a broad spectrum of political theory, with a special focus in Christianity, ethics, and political thought. She received a BA from Boston College and her MA and PhD from the University of Toronto. She has been a visiting scholar at the University of Chicago in 2003 to 2004 and at Harvard University in 2006 to 2007. She has shown a special interest in political theory as it appears in the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. She won a Best Paper Award at the American Political Science Association annual meeting for her piece entitled Tolkien's Tales and Political Philosophy in Liberal Democracy. She teaches a popular freshman university seminar on J.R.R. Tolkien exploring the political thought in the Lord of the Rings series. Professor Keyes will be speaking tonight on J.R.R. Tolkien's literary politics. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Mary Keyes. Okay, well, it's a, a privilege and an honor to be here tonight and uh, to get to share some of my love of Tolkien's works with many others who I know uh, also love Tolkien's works. I'm especially grateful to everyone at the Center for Ethics and Culture, uh, especially Stephen Ferdoso and Angela Bermudez and all the students who work so hard to put this lecture series together for including me. Uh, and the first two lectures have been wonderful, and I'm happy to continue the discussion and pave the way for Professor Wood's lecture as well next week, uh, which I wouldn't miss if I were you. It will be a treat. Uh, like many of you, I suspect, I read Tolkien's first bestseller, The Hobbit, when I was a little girl, and I liked it. I didn't love it, but I liked it a lot. That was it, though. In ninth grade, I read The Lord of the Rings, required reading for a literature class, and I fell in love. I loved it. I couldn't stop. Um, I kept rereading it. And a few years later, I begged my way into a university class my freshman year at Boston College, a closed upper-level class, politics, philosophy, and literature, Tolkien, taught by Peter Kreeft. Um, and that was it for a long time. Then graduate school happened. Um, and I stopped reading fun books <laughs> and read a lot of them. <laughs> it will do that to you if you're not careful. It doesn't have to, little aside. Um, you can do better than I did. But I think I read The Gulag Archipelago, a very rather dark novel um, that wasn't really a novel by Solzhenitsyn, and that was it in grad school. Uh, but, so that was it. And then I began teaching at Notre Dame and more of the same. And then... Uh, one day, something surprising happened that started me on an unexpected journey back into Tolkien's work and into connecting it with my work, which is a study of political philosophy, especially looking at ethics and politics and the history of political thought. 
Uh, that day was September 11th. Last week it struck me it was the anniversary of September 11th when uh, we had Professor O'Connor's lecture. And the actual September 11th, 2001, um, occurred that very sad day. Uh, my sister, my younger sister, was working in Washington, D.C. in an area that was evacuated as a near a possible threat for more terrorist activity. So a couple days later, I was on the phone with her, and she surprised me. She said, Mary, you know, I've been thinking about this, and doesn't the situation in the United States just the past few months remind you of the beginning of The Lord of the Rings? And I said, actually, no. <laughs> How is <laughs> Um, those are my favorite books, not yours. How did you come up with this? But then, yeah, she said, well, like, look at it this way. The hobbits at the beginning of The Lord of the Rings were clueless. They were naive. They thought they lived in a world where right, uh, anyone who was a decent person had a right to peace and freedom, and the world was a kind place, and they had nothing to be afraid of, by and large, of the world. They had no idea that they were being protected from serious dangers around their border and within their community even. And that's much the way we were just a few weeks ago, uh, before September 11th. So I listened to my sister and I thought, she's right, and here's my excuse to reread my favorite books for the first time in 17 years. <laughs> uh, and so I began to reread them. Being a professor, I assumed that it was my scholarly duty to be thorough, and I would begin with The Hobbit. And this is where I was shocked. And you'll see tonight, um, it's also in honor of Peter Jackson's upcoming movies, but I'll be focusing quite a bit on The Hobbit. And that book, which is a child story, it seems a very simple story, uh, again, amazed me when I read it. <coughs> After having studied political theory for many years, it was obvious to me that Tolkien was also steeped in this study. An expert in philology, he knew the classics of the Western tradition very, very well. And it had never occurred to me that his worldview incorporated so much from the history of ethics and political thought. Also, his literary style, I realized, was incorporating motifs from Plato's Republic even from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, which is not easy to do <laughs> uh, in a very, uh, you could say, lively story. And I couldn't, again, I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, I need to go more deeply into these political themes. <coughs> and so tonight, I would like to spend quite a bit of time on The Hobbit. Um, in just a moment here. So for those of you who haven't read these books recently, especially I will be uh, talking a bit about some of the motifs from Plato's Republic. The subtitle of Plato's Republic is that's traditionally given, may or may not have been from Plato, but that's traditionally given is on the just, on what it means to be just, on why one should want to be just. The Hobbit, or There and Back Again, Tolkien's story, I'll argue tonight, could have the same subtitle on the jest. Again, it could surprise us, but I think it's written into the story. Um, there are a few other features of Plato's Republic, especially from books one and two, that I'd like to call to mind. And for those who haven't read the dialogue, it, it, won't, it shouldn't detract from the, from the argument that I'll make, but just to put a few things on the table from the Republic. Um, all right. Early in the Republic, Socrates, you remember, um, he is sort of, his friends twist his arm, his young friends uh, bring him back to the home of Polar Marcus, who's basically a college kid. He's a young, young man. Uh, and he lives with his very elderly father, Cephalus. And Cephalus, who would give Socrates such a warm welcome, very warm welcome. Socrates, you don't come here nearly often enough. You know, I, I've learned to love conversation and discussions as I get older, and you really should come more because I'm too old to get around. I really, I just don't get around well anymore, and you should come more often. Um, 
Socrates turns that into a question, basically. So what's it like to be on death's door? So Kephalus, what's it like to be almost in the other world? Tell us about it. Tell us a little bit. Is it as hard as people say it is? So he turns things into interrogations. Um, Kephalus then, again, he's very friendly, and Socrates says, eventually ask him, well, you're very rich. How does being rich help you deal with old age? I'd love to know. And Kephalus says, well, Having wealth basically helps you. you. You don't have to cheat anybody. If you've cheated anyone before, if you have any outstanding debts, if you owe people things, if you haven't been just, you can pay them back uh, because you have the wealth to do this with. So you are well prepared to leave this world, uh, having made amends for anything that you've done. And Socrates then again, instead of saying, well, thank you very much and being sort of the polite interlocutor, begins to question Cephalus um, as if he had just offered a definition of justice. Socrates says basically, well, but Cephalus, how can you know that's the definition of justice, telling the truth and paying back what you owe? And Cephalus, who's never tried to give a definition of justice, at this point politely excuses himself uh, and leaves the argument to his young son who can deal with Socrates a little bit better. Huh. At the beginning of The Hobbit, it's striking. Gandalf, no one's twisted his arm. Gandalf comes on his own, his own initiative to visit Bilbo. Uh, but it's striking that Gandalf begins in much the same way, you could say, with these Socratic interrogations. So Bilbo sees the elderly wizard at the door, um, and he says, not surprisingly, good morning, said Bilbo, and he meant it. The sun was shining, the grass was very green. But Gandalf looked at him from under long, bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. What do you mean, he said? Do you wish me a good morning? Or mean that it is a good morning, whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning? Or that it is a morning to be good on? <laughs> and so um, Bilbo is in flustered, he's all of them at once, um, et cetera, et cetera. But, but Gandalf begins to question. He has this Socratic questioning um, style. Other things from the Republic's beginning that I think we see early, again, motifs being played with, uh, changed, transformed in literary fashion by Tolkien. He's not giving an allegory of the Republic or any other work, the Nicomachean ethics of politics, not at all. But he's playing with these motifs, I think, throughout the whole book. Pola Marcus, the young fellow who again inherits the argument from Cephalus, from his father, uh, tries to save his father's definition of justice by making it more precise. He says, well, yes, Socrates, justice is helping friends and harming enemies. That's what it means to pay what you owe. You owe friends help and you owe enemies harm. Socrates begins to question this definition and at the very end of, the, of uh, the first book of the Republic, or even before that, has disproved the portion about harming enemies. Socrates gets Polarmarchus to agree that a just person never voluntarily harms anybody. But as many scholars have noted, Socrates doesn't completely undo the notion that justice has something to do with helping friends, although he helps uh, helps the young people get precise on what a friend might mean. Another point, early in the Republic, discussing what justice is, again with Polemarchus, Socrates indicates to him that justice cannot simply be a craft. It can't be how-to knowledge, knowledge of how to do something. Um, in particular, Polemarchus suggests that justice in peacetime is the knowledge of how to guard things, how to keep things safe for your friends. Um, Socrates turns that on his head, and he gets Polemarchus to agree that if, well, if justice is simply how to, how to guard in this case, how to guard your friend's things, uh, then the just person would also be the best thief by that definition. A good person at guarding would be the person who's able to steal. Um, just think of the computer virus protection or spyware designers, right? They have to know all the intricacies of how one could hack into your machine. 
And so if they don't have motives other than uh, just practical knowledge, they could go bad easily. Um, so again, Socrates suggests this doesn't make sense, but if it's true, the just person would also be a good thief. File that away for Bilbo the burglar. <laughs> um, Glaucon in book two. Um, this is Plato's younger brother who enters the dialogue, who was with Socrates at the beginning. And he is the one who is probably the most passionate in his desire for Socrates to defend the goodness of justice, to show him, Glaucon, that it's worthwhile holding on to what is good, even if it means that you have to die for it. Um, and he tells the story. He says, Socrates, I'm going to tell this not in my own words, not with my own heart, but I'm going to blame justice as, harsh, as, as harshly and as strongly as I have heard it be blamed, because I want you to be able to answer this. I can't answer these people, but I want to defend justice. And Glaucon tells the famous story of the Ring of Gyges, a shepherd who discovers uh, an, uh, an ancient golden ring and who realizes that in putting it on, he becomes invisible. And so the story that Glaucon has heard goes, um, there's no way that anyone who would have that ring would not commit injustice. There's no way, because that person can go undetected. He can become the king, he can become very wealthy, he can benefit all his friends because he's much richer. And he'll never be caught, he'll never be punished. Only an idiot would be just under those circumstances. Uh, again, Glaucon suggests for Socrates to refute him. Yeah. So with that as backdrop then, my argument tonight will be twofold. First, that Tolkien's work illustrate a familiar theme of classical political philosophy uh, namely, the priority of friendship in a certain sense to justice and the necessity of friendship, a friendly attitude, affection, for justice to be approximated, much less achieved. Secondly, and so in, in the first regard, I think Tolkien is following uh, leads from Plato and Aristotle and other classical thinkers. Secondly, and I'll develop this less, but I think it's equally as important, Tolkien follows Christian thinkers, especially Augustine. And I think The Lord of the Rings is a much more fundamentally, I to say, deep Augustinian work than The Hobbit. Uh, the Hobbit seems to be more classical in many ways. We can talk about this, but it's certainly still inspired in ways by Augustine. Um, and that's that... One can neither have friendship in the deepest sense or enduring justice where there is not humility, where pride is valued and humility is denigrated. The dynamic of the argument goes something like this. If you want peace, work for justice. If you want greater justice, cultivate friendliness and friendship. If you want to be more capable of both justice and friendliness and friendship, value humility highly, and fight against pride. In his essay on fairy stories, and again in his letters, Tolkien stresses the danger of scholarly attempts such as mine to analyze uh, works of literature. Uh, in some of his letters, some of you who have read them, you know, he is not very, um, how to say it, um, well, you wouldn't want to get the letter that he sent the guy who asked him, uh, can you help me with my analysis of your stories for some scientific publication? It was very dismissive, apologetic at the end for being so dismissive. But he says, I just don't like these studies. <laughs> um, sorry, I can't be nicer because I really don't like these. Uh, Tolkien's main concern is that these analyses tend to ignore the story as a whole. They tend to pick out pieces of the story and then subject them to scientific analysis in such a way that you've butchered the whole. I think Tolkien even quoted Gandalf to Saruman in his letter to this poor social scientist, probably, who wanted to analyze his works. Um, that a quote from Gandalf to Saruman in The Lord of the Rings, he who breaks a thing to find out what it is has left the path of wisdom, right? So he's not pleased. Um, so I'm obviously on shaky ground, right? Um, and, 
Um, and in his essay on fairy stories, he puts it, you could say, um, more placidly. He writes, ignorance or forgetfulness of the nature of a story as a thing told in its entirety has often led such inquirers into strange judgments. <laughs> All right, we want to avoid strange judgments. So in order to both avoid this pitfall, strange judgments, uh, from not taking the story in its entirety, and also for your listening pleasure, tonight I will recount for you the story of the Hobbit, the prelude to the Lord of the Rings. Um, and I'll tell the story focusing on aspects related to friendship and justice, but I hope not to distort the whole. You can call me on it in the question and answer period. Um, and in question and answer also, obviously anything goes. There's so many political themes that I won't even get a chance to touch on tonight. Uh, best regimes, different forms of government and the Lord of the Rings, political leadership, um, anything, anything literally um, goes, but this is one focus. Two more things about The Hobbit before we begin. Um, well, chiefly, The Hobbit has often been interpreted by Tolkien scholars, again, this perilous group, uh, as a tale of the psychological maturing of its hero, Bilbo. You know, Bilbo, you have this little hobbit from the Shire, very sheltered. He gets out of the Shire, goes through dangers, grows up, um, and becomes the person that he was meant to be, psychological and human maturing. Uh, and it certainly is that. Um, but on my reading, it deals as much or more deeply with the relation between justice and friendship in its protagonist and in their, their communities and societies. Um, a second point, again, The Hobbit is typically regarded as a child's story, um, not one worthy of serious scholarly reflection. And Tolkien himself, in many letters, said as much, and in his works to his publishers, The Hobbit is a much more childish story than The Lord of the Rings. Things get, are dark enough in The Hobbit, but they get really dark in The Lord of the Rings, and they're darker still in The Silmarillion. It's much more that it's closer to a bedtime book, he would say, than, than his, other, his other works. Um, but it's interesting to note that Tolkien also gives us to understand uh, later on that he really didn't see The Hobbit as a child's book. Uh, this is from an interview that he gave the Sunday Times in 1967. And the, the interviewer said something along the lines of, well, Mr. Tolkien, uh, I understand that you wrote The Hobbit for your children and you read it to them at bedtime. And then later you decided to publish it. Is that how it happened? And uh, Tolkien said, um, and I quote, that's all sob stuff. No, of course I didn't. If you're a youngish man and you don't want to be made fun of, you say you're writing for children. <laughs> At any rate, <laughs> yeah, true confessions, right? Okay. You are writing about The Hobbit, and uh, your colleagues at Oxford are going to be looking at you. It's at least better if it's for children. You can say this was for children, because they already think you're nuts, right? Um, so, no, of course I didn't. You're a youngish man, and you don't want to be made fun of. You say you're writing for children. At any rate, children are your immediate audience, and you write or tell them stories for which they're mildly grateful long rambling stories at bedtime. <laughs> All right, so there's Tolkien. So this was not written for children, uh, but yes, you tell these stories to your kids. And on fairy stories much earlier, Tolkien had already explained that in his view, a good fairy story, as he certainly hoped The Hobbit would be, could not be written primarily for children. It, it just couldn't be. It wouldn't be what a good fairy story is supposed to be. And this is what he wrote in On Fairy Stories. If fairy story as a kind is worth reading at all, it is worthy to be written for and read by adults. They will, of course, put more in and get more out than children can. Then, as a branch of genuine art, children may hope to get fairy stories fit for them to read, yet within their measure as they may hope to get suitable introductions to poetry, history, and the sciences, though it may be better for them to read some things, especially fairy stories, that are beyond their measure rather than short of it. Their books, like their clothes, should allow for growth, and their books, at any rate, should encourage it. <laughs> All right, so 
Um, with that as some evidence that, again, Tolkien wrote The Hobbit for children, but also and probably especially for adults, um, I begin to retell Tolkien's first famous tale. The adventure of that most respectable hobbit, Bilbo Baggins, began with an unexpected party in his most respectable hobbit hole. Bilbo was an experienced grown-up hobbit, about 50 years of age, but with a youthful attitude. He was fond of parties and guests, for he was comfortably well off and took pleasure in sharing his leisure and his goods with others. In this case, however, his hospitality and his provisions seemed unusually and uncomfortably out of his rightful control. Bilbo did not even know the 13 dwarves who invaded his abode one afternoon, and their manners did not measure up to Shire standards. He did know Gandalf, the wizard, who, unbeknownst to Bilbo, had invited the dwarves, and who, moreover, had recommended the hobbit to them as their companion on a long and perilous journey they were about to undertake. The purpose of the expedition was the recovery of stolen treasure and the exaction of vengeance on the robber, one smog the dragon, who had cruelly murdered many among their family and friends, and who had destroyed the dwarves' great polity, the kingdom under the mountain. In the same assault, smog devastated the neighboring town of Dale, a prosperous place inhabited by humans. In short, the dwarves' quest was about exacting and restoring justice, chiefly through the recovery of stolen property. Yet from the beginning, Tolkien tells this tale with an ironic, playful twist. Through the words and actions of various characters, the meaning and value of property, of one's own, and hence also of justice, strictly speaking, are repeatedly called into question. In recruiting Bilbo to help regain lost goods, for instance, Gandalf is rather free with Bilbo's own goods, not only with the hobbit's food and drink, but also with his home. To tip the dwarves off to the location of the correct hobbit hole and to jolt unwilling Bilbo into opening the door to 13 uninvited guests, the wizard first scratches and then later dents, he bangs a hole in, practically, Bilbo's beautiful green front door, as Tolkien tells us twice. Um, Gandalf thus seems curiously unconcerned about property, at least about what is due to Bilbo as proprietor of Bag End. The wizard does express an interest in profiting the Hobbit, although this is strange enough, given that Gandalf repeatedly underscores, and so does Thorin, um, the likelihood of fatality that this quest entails. Um, that it's quite likely he will not come back. Even the dwarves, desirous as they are of their lost treasure, tease Bilbo for being so solicitous, so concerned about his household goods, and they compose this little ditty in his honor. Clip the glasses and crack the plates, blunt the knives and bend the forks. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Smash the bottles and burn the corks. Thus the reader is led to see, from the beginning of The Hobbit, that Bilbo's heart is especially in his household management and taking care of his own home, which evinces the greater naturalness of his way of life. And it's striking, despite being so wealthy, one of the wealthiest of The Hobbits, Bilbo is described in the book, you pick up details the narrator gives. He washes his own dishes. He does his own baking. He does his own cooking. He dusts his own mantelpiece. In other words, he doesn't employ a bevy of servants. He loves taking care of his home. And presumably, since he also loves flowers, because there isn't enough time to take care of the inside and the outside of the home, he does employ a gardener full time, first uh, the, the gaffer and later the famous Samwise Gamgee. By contrast, the dwarves' thoughts and longings are focused on beautiful artifacts, on things that they and their ancestors have made, and on the magnificence of their dwelling under the mountain. Their affection is given, and I quote, to the beautiful things made by their own hands and by cunning and by magic, a fierce and jealous love, the desire of the hearts of dwarves. Their chief aim on this errand is to claim our long forgotten gold, even before it seems avenging their dead. 
Once the double irony that is Gandalf's, as Gandalf prods them, they employ the most respectable hobbit available on account of his excellent credentials at burglary. Why? <laughs> when their errand is not theft, but to reclaim stolen goods, and when the hobbit they hire has an impeccably clean record, so far as we know. Um, why is he hired for burglary? To Bilbo's consternation at his new professional title, he's rather dismayed by it, one of the dwarves replied, you can say expert treasure hunter if you like, some of them do. It's all the same to us. Gandalf told us that there was a man in these parts looking for a job at once, and he arranged for a meeting here this Wednesday at tea time. Against both his better judgment and his self-preservation instinct, Bilbo meets the dwarves the next morning as they set off, and in so doing, seals the contractual agreement. Again, they have a business partnership here, a contract, whereby burglar Bilbo promises to assist Thorin and company in their peculiar, risky business venture. If they succeed, one fourteenth of all profits, however defined, will be his. If they fail, all his travel and or, and or funeral expenses will still be covered by the company. As they set off in search of the lonely mountain, where smog now reigns from a heap of treasure, Bilbo leaves behind the goods and properties to which he is most attached, the material comforts his heart most desires, and the land most possessed of his affections. He hopes to return to them, but for now he freely detaches himself from their secure enjoyment, although painfully and with difficulty, for the sake of an intangible adventure that he also deep down desires. The dwarves, by contrast, are moving ever closer to the properties they most wish to reacquire, towards highly valued goods that are by, theirs by right, but not theirs to enjoy. This opposite interior movement along one and the same road, Bilbo away from his goods, the dwarves towards them, powerfully attracted by them, may help explain the sharp disagreement concerning the just and the good that erupts between Bilbo and Thorn at their journey's end. In principle, at least, a friendship that Aristotle would term useful or beneficial is formed between the hobbit and the dwarves when their contract is sealed. Their common business venture involves goods that they desire to attain but could not attain unaided. The company burglar is first called into action as such early on when the company is cold and famished in a forest and three trolls are found enjoying their stolen fare around a fire. Bilbo's words and deeds in this affair raise further questions about what is owed, about what is just in deed and in speech. Is Bilbo right to attempt burglary of the troll's stolen gold and provisions, for example, and if so, on what grounds? Ought he to tell them the truth, or as he later opts to mislead them concerning his companions, or purported lack thereof? It seems possible at any rate that the extraordinary circumstances Bilbo is in could alter what one would generally judge to be another's due in speech and in deed, and that one owes it to one's friends not unnecessarily to compromise their safety. The fledgling friendship between hobbit and dwarves is on this occasion, and on many others to follow, tested and forged beyond the bounds of the useful, beyond the bounds of strict justice or contract. To succor his companion's needs, Bilbo risks his safety to burglar goods other than the contractually specified stolen treasure. Uh, the dwarves, for their part, nearly die trying to rescue Bilbo from the troll's cooking pot. Only with their mutual friend Gandalf's aid do they all, except the trolls, escape alive in the end. As the company continues its march and advances through dangers, the tale of their adventures and perils shows up more difficulties concerning what is just. Some of these again stem from the unusual circumstances of the group's quest and its setting in fairy. In one key moment, Bilbo finds a ring deep beneath the mountain, where a gang of goblins, later known as orcs in the Lord of the Rings, has carried him and his companions. This is in fact the one ring, as Lord of the Rings readers will come to know it. Bilbo later learns that this ring belongs to a small, slimy creature named Gollum, 
But since Gollum evidently wants to eat Bilbo, and the ring proves magical in Bilbo's only hope of escape, the hobbit decides it's necessary to keep it, but significantly not to use it to kill Gollum when the latter is unarmed and at a, at a decided disadvantage. In the course of their negotiations, they engage in a high-stakes duel of riddles. If Bilbo wins, Gollum promises to escort him out of the mountains safe and sound. If Gollum wins, Bilbo will become Gollum's next meal. <laughs> this is not a fun game for Bilbo to play. At one point in the riddle game, Bilbo is flustered and afraid, and he accidentally asks a question that's not really a riddle. You remember, what have I got in my pocket? <laughs> um, that wasn't a riddle. Um, but Bilbo insists that Gollum answer it, um, and Gollum can't. Bilbo holds the game won, but has he really won, on fair or just terms? Bilbo's benign intent, com intent, compared with Gollum's murderous design, seemed to justify altering the rules of engagement, especially since Bilbo had not intended to cheat. Again, he just couldn't think of a riddle and blurts out this question. Yet one still senses that Bilbo is not entirely happy with his conduct. He would prefer that things be done in accord with the revered rationality of ancient custom. But necessity here compels him to accept a less respectable result. Out of the mountain at last, Bilbo is reunited with friends who have escaped again with Gandalf's help. To attend to other business of his own, um, and presum presumably Peter Jackson in the course of the next three movies will be uh, helping us be more familiar with Gandalf's business, but it's not told in the, in the book version of The Hobbit, but he disappears again. Um, and he leaves them on the dark edge of Mirkwood, the perilous forest that they have to cross to reach the mountain where the treasure lies. Lost in the forest, the group's provisions again fail. On the brink of starvation, they're captured by wood elves. And again, as uh, David O'Connor pointed out last week, those are Legolas's people. Right? So Thorin and the dwarves are um, imprisoned by Legolas's folks <laughs> um, in Mirkwood. Um, and uh, so they're all captured except for Bilbo. Um, and Bilbo follows them into the palace with the ring rendering him invisible. The dwarves are treated decently by the elves and yet they're imprisoned on account of the long mistrust between the two peoples, the elves and the dwarves. This mistrust, we learn, had its roots in an ancient dispute about property and what was on some occasion due to whom. The elves, we learn, interpret this event and its causes one way, while the dwarves have an alternative memory and account. Neither view is verified in the story but it seems likely that there is something, if not an equal portion, of the jest on each side. The narrator does imply in this instance the elves may have been more at fault because their king desires riches. Thorin knows this. The elf king loves treasure. He loves beautiful gems and gold. He does not want to take the trouble to learn how to make them. Thorin's conclusion, he will, take, he will want my treasure <laughs> um, and he will not want to pay, you know, or uh, he will not be able to pay. So Thorin refuses to tell them all about their quest. Um, and because of that, um, they are imprisoned. The author also writes that the wood elves tended to suspect or mistrust strangers. As a result of this unfriendly stance, the elves now misinterpret the starving Thorin and company's begging for harassment and even crime, as they call it. Um, and they're imprisoned. They're treated decently, well-fed, um, but imprisoned until they tell the whole truth. The invisible Bilbo is thrust back on a wearisome life of bur burglaring in the palace to keep body and soul together and to prepare to rescue his friends, which, of course, in the end, he does. Differing and perhaps necessarily partial perceptions about what is just excessive desires to acquire, and long-standing unfriendly mistrust hinder what is due from being known and achieved throughout this painful episode. The problematizing of property and with it of justice reaches high point at the story's climax. If you've read the story, you'll remember Thorin and company finally reach the Lonely Mountain with burglar, burglar Bilbo's aid. They steal into a secret entrance in the mountainside. 
Bilbo performs his famous function ably. First, he lifts the golden cup from under Smog's nose um, because of the ring, which renders him invisible. And later, he engages Smog in a clever conversation with the aim of discovering a weak spot in the dragon's armor, which again, he succeeds in doing. But the immensity of the treasure hoard and Smog's keen sense of smell quash any hopes of even invisible Bilbo's being able to steal back the hole. How will the, tr the, the dwarves get their gold? The company does not seem to include warriors or heroes, as Gandalf points out early in the story, who could slay a dragon. Worst of all, during Bilbo's dialogue with the dragon, which is exceedingly witty, he momentarily lets his wit and daring go to his head. And he begins to, to name himself with heroic epithets that could be right out of Homer. <laughs> um, they're extremely, uh, you know, I am he who buries his friends in water and pulls them out alive again. And, you know, he goes on and the driver's like, what's your name? <laughs> and then Bilbo gets really, he won't say Bilbo from the Shire, but he, you know, I am. Uh, and so he keeps going on and on. And the, the dragon's like, I doubt it's true, but it's very impressive. Keep right on going, right? And, um, and then Bilbo says, again, he's all excited. And he says, I am barrel rider. And that was very bad because with that epithet, Smog knows that Bilbo got help from Lake Town where they send barrels of wine down the river and trade. So he has just implicated a town um, in his theft of the dragon's treasury and knows that the dragon will likely be going there for vengeance very soon. Remarkably though, not, Bilbo recognizes his blunder but remarkably, he's humble enough to admit it right away. He tells the dwarves, I'm really concerned. This is what I've said. Um, I have a feeling Lake Town is in deep trouble. A friendly bird overhears this and flies off to warn the town's inhabitants of their impending peril, and also to tell them of the, the location of the unprotected spot in Smog's jewel-crusted belly. At Lake Town, Smog meets his match in a warrior named Bard. But despite the dragon's demise, the town is destroyed and a third of its people perish. The rest are left in cold hunger and sorrow. The wood elves come to the relief of Lake Town and together men and elves in arms march on the lonely mountain. They presume the dwarves are dead and they are going to reclaim the treasure to compensate for all the unjust harm they have suffered. But instead, they find Thorin and company alive and well and reveling in their own recovered treasure. Um, even before the arrival of the lake men and the wood elves announcing the dragon's death, Bilbo had been concerned about the dwarves' covetousness um, and its likely consequences. A first foray into the treasure chambers had mesmerized his companions. They, and here's a quote, cried out to one another as they lifted old treasures from the mound or from the wall and held them in the light, caressing and fingering them. They gathered gems and stuffed their pockets and let what they could not carry fall back through their fingers with a sigh. Bilbo also felt moved by the magnificence of it all. And in fact, he had quietly pocketed the Arkenstone, the most beautiful gem, the most precious gem of the entire treasure hoard, which he found and without saying anything, um, took for his own. Um, still, the hobbit managed to collect his wits and in the end escaped the treasure's maddening spell. This is another quote. Long before the dwarves were tired of examining the treasures, <laughs> Bilbo became wary of it and sat down on the floor and he began to wonder nervously where this would end. Bilbo reflected then that a warm, cheerful draught from a friend's wooden bowl would be preferable to a whole pile of jeweled goblets. Maddened by the lake men's claims on his wealth and infuriated by the mere presence of the wood elves, his former jailers after all, Thorin sticks to his far outnumbered guns and to his own narrow vision of what is just or right. As heir to the kingdom under the mountain, he still assumes that the treasure is his exclusive just and rightful inheritance. Never mind that the hospitality of the lake men to the dwarves and their need, together with the carelessness of the dwarves' contracted burglar, had led to a grievous injustice against the townspeople. Never mind that the lake men bard had slain the dragon and so made the actual repossession of the treasure possible for the dwarves. 
Never mind that the dragon's plunder under the mountain also included goods stolen from the former men of Dale, from whose chieftain Bard was an, uh, descended. Thorin might eventually come to honor the last claim, the narrator tells us. He would certainly pay his company's bills for their food and lodging in Lake Town once the elves and armed men had gone away. Yet he remains unmoved even by pity at such great human suffering caused to others by his own quest. His passionate yearning for his own is too exclusive and too powerful to allow him to open his eyes, to freshly perceive and more broadly understand what in the circumstances is truly due to whom. Tolkien writes, the lust of gold was heavy on him, and the desire for properties about which were wound old memories of the labors and the sorrows of his own race. So Thorin remains stubborn, and a bloody conflict threatens to break out. You can see why even the early editors and publishers thought this was a little serious for a children's story. Um, this is what you're reading to little Joey. Um, and here we are. Um, some of the younger dwarves are grieved, the narrator tells us they wish they could welcome the elves and men as friends. But they don't presume to contradict Thorin. Only Bilbo, again little Bilbo, is confident that Thorin's conduct is fundamentally unjust and unwise, likely to harm even the dwarves in the end. And so he hatches a plan to try to prevent such unnecessary bloodshed. His leverage comes once again from his burglary this time of the Arkenstone, which had belonged to Thorin's grandfather and which the dwarf king desires now above all else. Bilbo initially reasoned, or rather rationalized, uh, that it was all right for him to take the Arkenstone because Thorin had promised him to choose his own share of the treasure, his own 14th. So he said, well, it's about a 14th, you know, and I'll just take it. But his conscience bothered him. We see that throughout the story. He might well have returned it earlier, but for fear of Thorin's rage. Now the situation has become so extreme that Bilbo's courage is, is, is roused, and he decides to deliver the Arkenstone over to the other side for them to barter with. I think Thorin will want this badly enough. He will hand over some of the treasure to them. He does this not to betray his friends, but to save them. King Thorne included from Midas' curse and from committing more injustice against others. The exact attribution of property in the Arkenstone is no longer of prime importance. At this moment, it's difficult even to determine to whom it really belongs. And here's the dialogue from this climax. I'd argue the story's climax. Bilbo, not without a shudder, not without a glance of longing, handed the marvelous stone to Bard and he held it in his hand as though dazed. But how is it yours to give, he asked at last with an effort. Oh, well, said the hobbit uncomfortably. It isn't exactly, but well, I am willing to let it stand against my claim, don't you know? I may be a burglar, or so they say. Personally, I never really felt like one, but I am an honest one, I hope, more or less. Anyway, I'm going back now, and the dwarves can do what they like to me. I hope you will find it useful. I don't think I ought to leave my friends like this, staying with the you know, elves and men in safety, as he's offered the chance to do. I don't think I ought to leave my friends like this after all we've gone through together. Gandalf is in the camp disguised as an old man and overhears it all. He warmly approves of Bilbo's deed. Thorne is enraged, however, and rejects Bilbo utterly as a traitor. And this is a quote. Take him, he says to the men, if you wish him to live, and no friendship of mine goes with him. So um, yet, at this point, you'll recall, a surprise assault by a powerful common enemy at last unites the dwarves, elves, and humans in a common cause. And Thorin and Bilbo finally part in friendship. A more just, indeed generous, distribution of the recovered treasure is, is achieved at Thorin's own behest. Thorin has fought bravely in the common defense and has been grievously wounded. He lies dying under the lonely mountain, and this is a very moving scene, and he takes his leave of the rehabilitated <coughs> burglar. Farewell, good thief, Thorin said to burglar Bilbo. Bilbo, I now go to the halls of waiting to sit behind my fathers until the world is renewed. 
Since I leave now all gold and silver and go to where it is of little worth, I wish to part in friendship from you, and I would take back my words and my deeds at the gate. There is more in you of good than you know, some courage and some wisdom blended in measure. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. But sad or merry, I must leave it now. Farewell. Bilbo in turn takes his leave of Thorin, thanking him for the undeserved privilege of sharing his perils, for which the hobbit is truly grateful. Then Bilbo weeps long and bitterly for Thorin's death, confirming what the reader has noticed, that the, the hobbit has, throughout the quest, very easily come to care for the dwarves for their own sakes. He has achieved a much fuller relationship of friendship on his part with them uh, than the contract with which the story began. Um, and he weeps long, long for, Bil for Thorin. Um, all right, I can skip a bit here. So, uh, Bilbo more easily than the dwarves transcends the useful, chiefly instrumental friendship that their business contract began. And the attitude of deeper friendliness that he cultivates has opened for him a fuller perspective on justice. Throughout the journey, Bilbo has likewise come to realize more and more his dependence for a meaningful life um, on his friends and their, their company. Um, this is what the narrator tells us um, that Bilbo says when he is, um, after he's lost the dwarves, but when he is really coming into his own as a warrior, still he says, what a mess we are in now. We, I only wish it was we. It's horrible being all alone. Gollum, by contrast, the previous owner of the ring, has chosen or at least resigned himself to a solitary life. Um, and we could talk more about that uh, perhaps later in question and answer. The story of The Hobbit ends where it began, in Bilbo's beloved home in the Shire, and with Bilbo's property in jeopardy. After only a year away, Bilbo returns to find that he is presumed dead, and his house is again full of uninvited guests. This time his belongings are being auctioned off. Um, you remember this, he comes home, he's like, wait, there goes my sofa, <laughs> there goes my chair, what's going on, I'm alive, it's me. Um, people don't want to believe it's him because they really want his stuff. <laughs> Um, basically. Um, he has to buy back some of his own furniture. He can't get them to agree that it really was his, and so he has to pay for it, um, but he gets it. Um, his household goods are mostly recovered, but his formerly good name is not. His reputation for respectability has gone the way of most burglars. Um, you'll remember he's held in high esteem among his young nieces and nephews on the Took side of the family. Uh, but the narrator tells us even they were not encouraged in their friendship by their elders. <laughs> Bilbo seems untroubled by this unjust loss of repute. He takes up writing poetry and returns to visit the elves very often. Years later, his old friends Gandalf and Balin, the dwarf who developed the strongest affection for Bilbo for the hobbit's own sake, come to visit him, and they bring him encouraging news of peace and prosperity in the lands around the, the Lonely Mountain. Wealth abounds, the land is green and fertile, government is much improved among human beings, and commerce bustles up and down the running river. The narrator stresses not that justice finally reigns in those lands, but rather that friendly relations have been restored and strengthened among their peoples, the dwarves and elves and men. This is the hobbit's formula for a social and civic, you could say, happily ever after. And I quote, and there was friendship in those parts between elves and dwarves and men. Um, I'll just add, I think since it's a little later than I realized, I think I, we can talk about humility and question and answer if you would like. Just, I'll just say two things about the importance of that. Tolkien in his, uh, his uh, jacket presentation for the original edition of The Hobbit twice calls Bilbo a humble hero. He's a humble hero, he's a humble adventurer. If you're interested in this kind of hero, this is a story for you, Tolkien says. Um, and the story is meant to give you glimpses into the politics of an important uh, period, uh, which was remarkable since Bilbo, the protagonist, was a hobbit. 
Uh, so likewise, the poet W.H. Auden entitled his, entitled his review of Tolkien's Fellowship of the Rings, quote, the hero is a hobbit. Um, Tolkien himself wrote that he tried to tell, he said, the tale that comprises the hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, he says, this is from his letters, mainly through the eyes of hobbits, but through hobbits, not men so-called to exemplify a recurring theme, the place in world politics, we could say, of the humble, of the deeds of virtue, of the apparently small, this is Tolkien, ungreat, forgotten in the places of the wise and the great. The literal ending of The Hobbit, right after the happy social and civic ending of friendship, uh, refers to humility. Um, Balan tells Bilbo, the lands are doing so well around the mountain that they're making songs which say the rivers run with gold. Then the prophecies of the old songs have turned out to be true after a fashion, said Bilbo. Of course, said Gandalf, and why should they not prove true? Surely you don't disbelieve the prophecies just because you had a hand in bringing them about yourself. You don't really suppose, do you? that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck and for your sole benefit. You are a very fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I'm very fond of you, but you are only quite a little fellow in a wide world after all. Thank goodness, said Bilbo, laughing. Thank you. Okay. We now have some time for some questions. Comments, objections? <laughs> Hi, you spoke of Tolkien referencing both uh, Plato's Republic and then the Nicomachean Ethics in The Hobbit. Was there, or sorry, is there a change in the types of, you know, classical literature that Tolkien referenced as he kept, uh, as he kept writing, did it change in the things that he would reference in one way or the other? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think more than referencing, I think it's a matter of Tolkien's vision being shaped by these works. So rather than he wants the reader to, I mean, I don't think he necessarily wants people to think, oh, that's the Republic, or oh, that's the Nicomachean Ethics. Just, oh, this is the way the story's told. This is the way the world works. This is the way things could be, or perhaps could be. Um, and I do think, um, and here, this is something that his son Christopher Tolkien wrote in the, the preface to the Silmarillion, um, and in some other places, that Tolkien's, you could say, uh, preoccupations of his thought that translated into his, into his stories and his reworking of the stories moved from being primarily uh, linguistic and literary to being more primarily philosophic and theological. And I think, again, it's interesting. Tolkien says in his letters that both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are written primarily from a hobbit point of view or a human point of view. He says it makes them anth anthropocentric. Uh, but The Lord of the Rings, he also says, is written partially from an elvish point of view. <laughs> um, and The Silmarillion is written from the elvish point of view. And, and I bring that in because The Hobbit seems to be, you could say, in one level, the most purely human of Tolkien's stories. And because of that, I think the most important references are the ones that, I won't say the most important, because I don't, now that I think of it, I don't think that's true. But the bulk of the references, you could say, or the, the sources, seem to be from Plato or Aristotle. Um, a little bit of Augustine you can see in there, I think. And, um, but then, when you move to the Lord of the Rings, there's still plenty of Plato. Uh, but the, the core of the story is quite clearly a question, I'd say, of mercy and the relation of mercy and justice. It's present in The, in the Hobbit, but it's primary in The Lord of the Rings. And that, I think, is, is far more Augustinian and Christian in its reference 
in its uh, in, uh, to to understand it. So I, that's that's a progression that I that I think I see in the stories. I know if that re did that reply to your to get at what you were looking for. Okay. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I had a question about what you think prompted, so in, in your last response and in the talk, you talked about the move from uh, a more classical, like Aristotelian platonic emphasis in The Hobbit to an Augustinian emphasis in The Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. And I wanted you to talk about what makes you think that that happened just like textually or in terms of plot mm -hmm. briefly. Okay. Um, and also, what do you think prompted the move? Because you said that it's it's darker, it's progressively darker from The mm -hmm. Hobbit to The Lord of the Rings to The Silmarillion. Mm -hmm. And um, what resources were there? Why would he turn to Augustine for material that was darker to leave like <coughs> classical political? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Those, again, really good questions. Uh, the main textual evidence, all right. Um, you remember in the, in the Lord of the Rings, when Gandalf, that, what Tolkien says is a very important chapter, the shadow of the past, when Gandalf uh, explains to Frodo, you know, Frodo says, recall, what a pity that Bilbo didn't kill Gollum when he had a chance. Um, and Gandalf says, Something, you know, I didn't bring the text, but yes, it was a pity, a pity and mercy that kept him from striking. And the pity of Bilbo may yet rule the fates of many, you know, not least yours. <laughs> um, okay, to, to um, stepping back, in The Hobbit, we see that, that instance that Tolkien retells at the beginning of The Lord of the Rings, when Bilbo is, he's, he's put the ring on, He's running out of the cave because Gollum is going to not show him the way out, but try to kill him. And he has to jump, he has to get past Gollum, who's waiting to grab him. Even though he's invisible, Gollum has an amazing sense of smell and is incredibly strong. And he's, Gollum is sitting in an entrance waiting for Bilbo. Right? And so Bilbo, remember, he makes the decision, not a fair fight. It's interesting, in The Hobbit, he, Bilbo refers to it in terms of justice. This is not just, this is not a fair fight. He's unarmed, he can't see me. And so he makes the decision not to strike, but to take the crazy leap over Gollum, the high risk leap, and he's able to get out. Um, the original Hobbit did not have that sequence. You, you may be aware, but Tolkien, wrote the story of the Hobbit as a standalone. He never intended to write a sequel that would have more Hobbits, except that the public really wanted Hobbits. <laughs> and his publisher said, Hobbits, give us more Hobbits. Tolkien said, how about the Silmarillion? They said, uh-uh, no, 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 they want Hobbits, not gods and goddesses and elves and no, no, um, Hobbits, Hobbits. So um, Tolkien kept saying, well, the original story's ending was Bilbo lived happily ever after to the end of his days, which were extraordinarily long. I think Professor O'Connor also referred to that. It's like, okay, where do you go from there? Um, it's kind of hard. Um, that's it. And so, but then Tolkien's imagination, I think it's the, the bard or the muse or the, you know, the, the inspiration, he became more and more aware that the ring, would, the ring would be the link between the stories. And the story began growing in his mind of the Lord of the Rings. Well, to get from The Hobbit to The Lord of the Rings, he had to rewrite portions of The Hobbit. So next edition, you know, moved from literally at the end of the riddle game in the original, Gollum said, well, sir, that's very well, and here's your way out the door. <laughs> um, Gollum was very respectful of riddle rules, and uh, he actually honored his pledge. So that all changed. So it's, for whatever reason, it seems that the theme of um, which... By the way, the person who asked the question knows much better than I do. He's writing a thesis that has a lot to do with Augustine on mercy. Um, but is, the theme of mercy is clearly, and its relation to justice, is, is growing and growing in Tolkien's mind. And 
whether it's growing independently of the story, The Lord of the Rings or not, I don't know. But just from his conceiving and writing that story, you, you see that grow. Um, I guess to be fair, I would also say that it, it's probably The Lord of the Rings, you see a darker, in evil, an even closer, darker view of evil. But you also see, if less directly, an, a brighter light, I think, is, is present than in The Hobbit. They're, it's, it's less direct, but they're both there. Um, and uh, again, because Augustine is writing his, uh, his great work, The City of God, when Rome is falling apart, and he's dealing with how to, how to cope with what looks like a complete disaster. Um, let me just, one second here. Um, also say that Augustine, um, excuse me, Augustine Tolkien uh, wrote in his, Tolkien wrote in his letters that the core of the drama of the Lord of the Rings is a, a, a war over the honor of God, God or the honor of God. And it's also, I think, a case in which the question of um, uh, Idolatry, again, here I'm also borrowing from another amazing graduate student, but the question of idolatry and politics, of the political order turning itself into, or its rulers saying, here I am, worship me. You know, sacrifice all to the state, sacrifice all to its leader, and Sauron in this case. Uh, is, that's the heart of the story. Sauron wants to be God, he wants to be worshipped as God, and he is by his, by his slaves. And so, all those themes, again, and I, I could go on and on. Faramir, who, as, um, again, as we've heard recently, Tolkien writes, I don't know where he came from. Yesterday, I, this guy came waltzing into my story. <laughs> um, I didn't know him. Uh, I like him, but he's taking up a lot of time. But Tolkien said, uh, you know, if you read Faramir's speeches, they sound like you... It would have been remarkable if someone who had not read The City of God wrote Farmer speeches. I'll just say that about politics and um, politics and attitudes towards war and military glory, and uh, from a point of view of justice. So I think there's a lot of textual evidence that influences from rather direct or indirect, but I think rather direct from Augustine are 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 coloring Tolkien's vision more and more powerfully as he writes The Lord of the Rings. There goes the mic. <laughs> mm, getting late. Uh, and a charge that is often leveled at Tolkien is that he, he writes about and therefore theoretically thinks about some people being inherently better than others. I mean, it happens frequently with Aragorn and with Faramir and with Frodo and Sam and many of the characters. And some of them exhibit mercy, just like you've said, and that seems to be a kind of gate going up. But many of them, the ones that also are theoretically great or greater than, uh, don't. I mean, throughout the, the story, in particular, other members of the company like Boromir and uh, and uh, Legolas and Gimli uh, say, all right, slaughter them, you know, especially with Wormtongue. Everyone is going, kill him. And instead, Aragorn is the one that argues, no, you should, you should release him. I think Gan Gandalf does too, and both of them are mm -hmm. the leaders. They're the exceptional. They are the ones that even Theoden obviously defers to, even in his own hall. There's, neither of them are impolite enough to take him up on that after his uh, resurrection, you could almost say. But what, what do you think, is mercy the key to the exceptionalism, or why, does, why do characters for whom mercy is such a trait also swing back the other way? They, there is no clear pattern of it with anyone, even with Faramir, who is so, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. he is probably more based in Christianity than most of the other characters. He is far more kind, but he also slaughters orcs and uh, harrowed men just willy-nilly. Uh, what, what let me just, a friendly amendment there. I think Farmer is presented as saying he never kills anyone, <coughs> even a beast, 
needlessly. So, I mean, he's not for, he, he, at least as far as I can read the text, he's not um, indulging in random slaughter needlessly. It's, I think the strongest evidence, though, for the problem you point to is when he's, he's about to exact the, the letter of the law on Gollum, who's wandering in a pool that he has no way of knowing is, is under, you know, forbidden under pain of death. Well, how do you know that if you haven't been there before? Um, and if it's your first time there, you're really in bad, you know, rotten luck because, uh, you know, an arrow is what's is about to fly. Um, I guess I would just say that's a question that I need to reflect on more deeply. I think, for starters, Tolkien is presenting a view. He's not just, he's not allegorizing Christianity and he's presenting real characters. So from Sam, who is remarkable, but he's also, you know, the, the ordinary shire, shire hobbit with some incredible virtues and potentials, but the very much the ordinary sh uh, hobbit has to learn mercy. He learns it the very long way. Um, others may have learned it and later choose to forget it. Um, again, because Tolkien is very much also focused on the mystery of free will and, and um, its actualization over time. And so I think it's, he also very powerfully, so for example, when the hobbits return to the Shire, you can see the not necessarily entirely positive effects that being in battle have had on uh, Merry and Pippin, for example. Frodo has to restrain them. Um, and, and remind them so that they don't end up sort of, um, you know, using the same uh, unjust tactics, you could say, on, on, on the bad guys, but who aren't completely bad. Um, one thing, Tolkien's orcs are in principle not reformable. And so, I mean, that, this is, that's one, that if I had to pick my metaphysical flaw in The Lord of the Rings, <laughs> I mean, you know, guys who can have a conversation, how can they have no possibility of ever discovering the good, um, only if their wills are completely controllable by Sauron. And that seems to be the premise. And in Tolkien's imaginary world, that may work. But metaphysically, it doesn't seem to quite work for me. But the orcs are different. And, and then remember Sam's approach when, when in The Lord of the Rings, when he first sees a battle, which he doesn't like, of men against men. <laughs> um, he's like, he didn't like it at all. And um, he saw a, a fellow from the, the South um, Army who was dead, face down, with an arrow, arrows in his, in his neck or spears, I don't remember which. And Sam sort of muses, like, he wondered what his name was, where he was from, what lies or threats drove him from his home. Wouldn't he rather have stayed there in peace? You know, so you, you see, I think both moments of, you could say, moments of, of vision, possibly moments of grace, and also moments of, of decisions for betrayal and self-servingness. And so I think Tolkien does try to present a, balance, a, 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 a believable view of humanity, which is it's not all mercy and love, <laughs> unfortunately, until the world is renewed. <laughs> so, but yeah, thanks for that question, though. Hmm. I, uh... I guess this follows right on Great. top of that and your statement there is that it, just as a fan and a kid growing up, it always bothered me that you could feel for the ring wraiths a little more than you could feel for the orcs. Um, and uh, <laughs> as a, you know, long time Catholic, um, where, you know, there's always that theme of trying to see the good in somebody and trying to forgive one's enemies. And I, I have a really hard time actually seeing Lord of the Rings as being anything Christian, um, simply because of the fact that there is this definite unforgivable evil, and there is this sort of army of darkness out there um, that really, we, we almost, it, it almost seems more like, I hate to say it, but Calvinist, that, you know, but, but by the grace of some few humble thing, you know, you are, you are saved from, uh, the whole world is saved from something terrible uh, that seems unstoppable. And I don't know, is, is there a way you could speak to that, like, pure, quote-unquote, pure evil that seems to permeate certain characters, um, demons and things that show up uh, in the book that sure. don't seem to have a good side? 
Yeah, sure. I, th I think the demons are the easy ones. Again, I agree, the orcs are the hard ones the, for me. The, the demons are the easy ones because that's pretty standard theology. I mean, the, although Tolkien's, Tolkien's spirits are not identical to angels and, and Catholic theology, as far as I can figure, but they're, they're similar enough. And so once you've reached a certain firmness in your choice, and when you're an angel, you have perfect knowledge of what you're doing or close to it, that's it. You know, so that's, that's a little easier um, for me to, to, to see. Um, I think part of it is Tolkien, again, is not writing a Catholic allegory. It's sort of the Catholic vision that I think he also saw later in life. He had, did permeate this book. But he's also writing with literary freedom, and he's creating a world in which the story isn't exactly a pre-Christian narrative, but it's one that never really happened. So it's kind of... Um, more or less successfully. I just say, in the very end, um, even Tolkien in his letter surmises that Gollum may have had a last second conversion before hitting the fire of Mount Doom and received mercy. You know, so Tolkien seems pretty willing, and, and if people's wills were coerced, what will happen to them in the next life um, seems, you know, uh, how to say it. Uh, if it was not their, their will, the elves did not want to be morphed into orcs. Um, you know, there may be mercy for them too, but it's, it is, I, again, that's, I, I don't think it is, um, yeah, I, the, the, uh, the, the gods and the, the spirits are easier to, for me to work with than, than the creatures of flesh and blood who have reason, apparently, to some extent. Thank you for coming this evening. Let okay. us thank okay, Professor thank Keyes once again yeah. for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.